Support comes from Soaring Heart Natural Beds, where concern for the health and safety of sleep now extends to everything from curbside pickup and delivery to secure in-store appointments. Showrooms in Seattle, Bellevue, and now in Edmonds, or online at SoaringHeart.com. Hey, it's Patricia Murphy. It's Monday. This is Seattle Now. Yep, millions of women have left the workforce to keep things together at home. In a minute, writer Angela Garbas explains why that doesn't even begin to cover what women are sacrificing right now. But first, let's get you caught up. Another Seattle police officer is under investigation for being in D.C. on January 6th. SPD announced the news late Friday. That makes six officers being looked into by the city's Office of Police Accountability. Chief Diaz has said he'll fire any officer who was involved in the insurrection at the Capitol. Somebody sold the state a bill of goods to the tune of millions of dollars worth of bogus N95 masks. The head of the state hospital association told the Seattle Times they learned of the possible fakes from manufacturer 3M. Then on Friday, hospitals were instructed to look into it and pull any knockoffs from their supply. The Times reports that 3M is rushing a million masks to the state to help cover any shortfall. We'll learn more at a press conference later today. And the Seahawks weren't anywhere near yesterday's Super Bowl, but they did win an off-the-field honor. More than 700 players, coaches, and staff tested positive for coronavirus during the NFL's pandemic season. But according to the New York Times, the Hawks were the only team in the entire league with no confirmed cases. Go Hawks! The pandemic has shattered normal life for all of us, but women have been hit the hardest. 5.4 million women have lost their jobs since the start of the pandemic. The number is shocking in itself. But Seattle author Angela Garbas argues it doesn't even tell the whole story, that women have lost far more than a place in the workforce. She wrote about this in a recent piece for The Cut, and she's here right now. Angela, this piece actually starts with a story about you trying to write the piece itself. What happened? Um, yeah, I mean, I live in a home where there's a virtual kindergartner and I'm working from home and my spouse is working from home. And I mean, essentially there are no boundaries, right? And as much as you try to make boundaries, like closing an office door and saying, I'm going to be working, um, (laughs) basically I was trying to write and my daughter just came in and was like, I'm on my break. She has five breaks a day. And she was just looking for someone to talk to and be with. You know, part of that beginning of that piece is that I what I wanted to do was scream because I was like, your father is the one who's supposed to be watching you right now, but he's on a work call. And it's just taking a moment to realize that uh, my child doesn't think that my work is less important than her father's. Like what's happening is that we're all living under impossible conditions. And in that moment, like the rage that I felt had nothing to do with her had nothing to do with my husband. It had everything to do with, you know, these total systemic failures (laughs) part of our government. Like, I think about how it doesn't have to be like this, but we're all living under really unsustainable conditions that are difficult professionally and difficult psychologically and emotionally. And that's a completely relatable experience to anyone who has a young child right now, maybe even more than one, right? Maybe there's two kids coming in who are on break during that moment. And I think even for parents who have older children, you know, what goes on? Once you go into your little work zone and once your child is sitting in front of that Zoom school is a little bit of a mystery. And like you said, kind of out of our hands, we're just pulling it together all ad hoc right now every single day, just doing what we can do. You know, and I think that there's this hesitation to say like it's people almost don't want to admit how bad it is because you can always find someone who it's worse, you know. But I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to do in the piece was just acknowledge like, yes, we hear stats, but like we don't talk publicly about like the grief, right? Or like the emotional toll that this takes, which is really what is destroying people, I think, you know, from inside. We're all just doing our best and barely getting by. We're all going through it. And those are not our personal failings. Those are bigger problems in our society. You know, it's funny because I do have a little piece of paper that I stuck up on my son's little board in his room that I wrote to myself early in the pandemic, which was, I am not perfect, but I am doing this every single day. And (laughs) 
I'm going to take that from your note and like write it on my heart so I can remember that. (laughs) But we all, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, there are moments where we all had an idea of what our life was going to be like and it was nothing like it is today. And I think one of the larger points in your piece is that this is showing up in unemployment numbers in a way that we couldn't really quantify. Yeah. And I mean, when we all really started paying attention was when the unemployment numbers came out in October that showed that in September, hundreds of thousands of women dropped out of the workforce. And that just happened to coincide with school starting. Right. So people are already doing their professional responsibilities and then faced with childcare and virtual schooling on top of that. You just saw women leaving the workforce in droves. And, you know, I reject the framing that a lot of media has taken, which is that women, you know, have stepped back. You know, in fact, we have been forced out, squeezed out, thrown off the building. You know, I think it's really important how we talk about that. And, you know, the numbers are bad still. Like in December, a net 144,000 jobs were lost. They were entirely lost by women. You know, the other thing is like, this is a problem that's happening now, but this is a problem that's already existed. Like women have often left the workforce for caretaking, whether it's children or aging parents. And then when they come back, they come back to lower wages, they come back to lower level positions. And so we already know this is a problem. It's why our workforce women are underrepresented to begin with. And it's going to be a problem that persists for years, if not decades. Like this is like a once in a generation problem. So I think we need to talk about it that way. We need long term big solutions to it. And I think also there's something about these numbers that um, it's the same way we talk about COVID, right? 400,000 people have died. What does that even mean? Yeah, like unless you're touched by it every day, and I think at this point everyone's been touched by it in some way personally, but unless you're seeing that every day, like the numbers like don't, almost don't mean anything. They're so big. They're so overwhelming. They're so anonymous. And so that's why I think it's really, we need to like hold space for people to grieve and say like, this is what I've lost, like to put a number on it. You know, that was something for me that was eye opening to realize like, I've lost probably close to $40,000 in income this year. And like, I want to say like, money's not important, but it, it is, you know, and it's also unfortunately tied to some sense of self-worth, which I want to move away from that. But that's just not not where we're at as a society and not where I'm at personally yet. (laughs) And there's so much to unpack here because pre-pandemic, the messaging women were getting was, you can do this. You oh, yeah. can lean in. It. Lean in, people. We were even closing the wage gap, right? There was progress being made. But when the chips are down. I've seen it written, you know, I'm not the first person to say this, that, you know, in America, we no longer have a social safety net. We have women who do the majority of domestic work and care work. And it would be one thing if we valued that. I think like something's happening though, you know, The Cut and New York Magazine released this package that I'm a part of. The New York Times released a whole thing called The Primal Scream. Primal Scream, amazing multimedia journalism. And then last week there was a full page ad taken out in The New York Times that talked about how we need to have a Marshall Plan for Moms, which which says we should be paying mothers $2,400 a month, just a flat income to support people, right? And that is, I think it's an opportunity as we begin to see that we live essentially in a failed state, uh, we can at least start to imagine what does like a more equitable and just society look like for all people and for women. And so I think that that's, that's important. I think like it's an important conversation to have. This is really just the beginning. We really are at a tear it down, rebuild it situation right now when it comes to our lives and our workforce. Yeah, I remember this summer thinking that, you know, when everyone was out protesting and I was like, this is it, like, we're going to reimagine everything. And then I think it's like fatigue and so many things, like institutional ideas are really hard to undo. Institutional racism, as it turns out, doesn't come down with a few protests, right? And now I think there was a point I was feeling really bleak in the fall where I was like, I thought we were going to reimagine society. And now I just feel like everyone's just waiting for the vaccine and a stimulus check and we're all going to go back to our you know, lives where we're just trying to get by, you know, like not really make that money and not get ahead and not, you know, just climb this ladder that's not going anywhere. But I'm starting to feel like the conversation we're having around women and what this is doing to us and, you know, it affects women, but this is an issue that affects everybody, really. Um, Women are, you know, 50.8% of the population, right? This is the economic story of the year as far as I'm concerned, right? (laughs) Whatever gender or sex. I just feel like it's we're having another moment where we can talk about things. And, you know, change can be slow, but I really feel like there are more people who are aware of this 
and more people who want to talk about it and more people who are willing to vocalize how hard and difficult this has been and point the way forward because we're close to the problems. Therefore, we're close to the solutions. Where are there points for movement that we could, you know, reimagine, reinvent? I know that working from home has definitely been one of them. Yeah. So, I mean, I think greater <laughs> workplace flexibility, like it turns out you really don't need to be in an office to get the job done. We've all learned that. You know, I think offering people paid leave and, and time off for, and greater flexibility. These are things that I don't think are very radical, right? Like paid family leave, affordable, accessible health care, universal pre-K, which is, you know, we have a pilot program here in Seattle. They just passed it locally in Portland. I mean, these are programs that um, they just make sense. And they are, you know, I remember when Elizabeth Warren was, Elizabeth Warren, who tweeted out my article, I'd like to say. So we have people <laughs> who are paying attention to these policies. She was at the DNC talking about how child care is infrastructure for families, just the way roads and bridges are. And I think it's really time for us to have a reckoning and like acknowledge that. That's what I would say. So I think, you know, people should, you know, talk to their lawmakers about family leave. They should talk to their employers about leave, about flexibility. You know, we, um, I think we've got the numbers. Angela Garba is really great to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me, Patricia. Angela Garbus is the author of Like a Mother, A Feminist Journey Through the Science and Culture of Pregnancy. And she's the co-host of the Double Shift podcast. Check out her new article, In the Cut. Seattle Now is produced by Caroline Chamberlain Gomez, Claire McGrain, and Jason Pagano. Matt Martin produced today's show. Matt Jorgensen does our music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow.